it always happens, doesn't it? Like with 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 uh, with technology. Yeah, we, we put our we put our fate in the hands of this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't mean, know whether to be frightened or elated. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a good. That's an interesting thing to say. But I, it's just, it's actually funny. I mean, I, I joked with one of my interviewees in the in the film about this, uh, Derek Jensen, because we did our interview over Skype, and it took us so long to to actually get the connection stable and and have a, a conversation worthy of, of recording. And yeah, we sort of joked there that you know, yeah, we, in terms of giving over our lives to the machine, what mm-hmm. what the sort of consequences would be if we can't even have a a, a video conference, you know, a, a conversation on the computer. So you know, something as simple as a as a video chat always goes awry. Yeah. And I guess the reason I'm called PC01 is because uh, I have no control over that either. I mean, I'm at some internet cafe somewhere, so. Well, uh, we can call you by your your real name. Uh, Right. (laughs) We don't have to call you PC01. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, we're free to to do whatever the hell we want. Well, should we begin with some introductions? Um, can I, I? Can you hear me at all? Okay, now we can hear you. There you are. All right, you're yeah. back. I don't, I don't know what I did. That's well. Whatever it was, it was right. It's magic. Okay. <laughs> Great. Actually, let's do a mic test on you too, Zachary, because I haven't heard your voice. How am I doing? Is that okay? Oh yeah, well, I'm good. Great. Mm-hmm. Um, clear. Can I just ask PC01, what, what is your real name? So I, I, I missed that part of the conversation. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. My name is Jaw, like J O R E. Jaw, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Cool. It's like a Mad Max and Thunderdome name. Right. Yeah, I've never, I've never heard that before. Jaw? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Hello. Awesome. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Um, yeah, Mindful AI, if we want to do some intros, I'm all about that. Well, I mean, we all, we all can introduce ourselves. Um, yeah. I'm Marco. You all know me, and I could I have a number of remarks I'd like to make. Actually, mm-hmm. as just by way of setting some context for how <laughs> really? you know comes into that, you think, um, but there's a kind of you know micro history to uh, this conversation, which I think might be interesting and might be informative uh, as to how the rest of it unfolds. Um, but before we get into that, at least getting our names straight would be a good idea. Uh, Acronon um, <laughs> and, and TJW3. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Marco Morelli, uh, we've met. Uh, I spoke with Joy yesterday. We did a tech uh, check-in and I uh, got to say hi. And should we take turns? Sure. Yeah. I'm Sean. Nice to meet you. We going alphabetically? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> by screen name or by actual <laughs> <laughs> see it's all up to us <laughs> i'm tj williams that's me everybody no. that i haven't met <laughs> yeah hi tj zachary good uh, quick quick question marco how long's the call just so i know well originally we were doing them for 90 minutes we often go over so let's say 90 minutes and okay we could check in at that point and Okay, great. So I'll just say I, I have about 60 or 55. So just kind of let that out. So maybe, I mean, I had a few comments that, that I'll make at some point. I, I appreciated the movie. Um, but just to let you know, Marco, that I'll probably be out of here by like five to one. Okay. And, yeah. and just to mention, in case you are too shy to, you also wrote an article that I think in some ways speaks to the same kind of thing yeah. that George's documentary does, uh, but yeah. although from a very different perspective. So, yeah. and, you know, folks haven't necessarily read that yet, but it's called uh, Why the, the Human Singularity is Nearer. And it's about the internet and kind of this radical yeah. you know, plunge into screen culture. Um, 
so yeah when you're ready to go just just off. well i mean if it's i mean if you know maybe i could just jump off that i start by saying joe i really really enjoyed the movie um i i, I don't know how far i was to the end of it because there was no way to know when it was going to finish mm-hmm. so I, I had to end at some point even though i imagined it might go on for another 19 hours which would be a really like kind of nice conceptual artistic project but i will say i really appreciated it because um i, I kind of was obsessed with the same things and have still continued to be for the past decade uh specifically douglas rushkoff i think one of the great few minds that really understands what's going on in a way that i appreciate and uh the guy whose name i forget whose ted talk you kept returning back to um about essentially the bubble culture uh was mm-hmm. probably the first ted talk i ever sort of the only thing i ever shared on facebook back in the day when it first i mean right when it first came out i think my one line Eli Perissa was his name. Eli, right. Yeah. My one-line caption to that share, which is the only TED Talk I've ever shared, I think, was, um, you know, we don't see the world as it is. We see it as we are. Anais Nin would, you know, be turning in her grave if she knew how true this had become. Um, and so, you know, for a, the longest times, I've really, and I'll probably just kind of say my opening gambit, and then I'll just shut up and kind of, you know, let you and everyone else kind of jump in, but maybe just kind of plop my my overall opinion down, which was that, you know, I put this very, very clearly and squarely down to, you know, control. It's very, very simple. And to my own obsession around uh, free will and freedom and the fact that to, you know, varying degrees, we are all still very much enslaved in the the capitalistic model that we feed um, through the coercion of marketing and big data and all the things that your film talks about. So I see it as this, this ever continuing loop of feeding the beast (laughs) of quote unquote progress, which it is not, um, not by our own volition, but by the coercion of all these data points. And also to be perfectly squarely honest by our own ignorance of our own internal drives, which our conventional education system completely overlooks so it's actually not that difficult to coerce us in the, for the most part. You know, we're very easily coerced. Um, so for me, you know, the end game, and I don't know where you went with this because I might have missed, I mean, I felt like I must have seen an hour and a half of it or something. So I don't know, you know, if you... Oh, that's kind of, yeah, you almost made it. Almost, almost there. Yeah. I, I, I'd appreciate it um, if we could frame this discussion before we all jump in. Mm-hmm. And you were going to do that, weren't you, Marco? Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, do that. yeah well let's let's Pretty take well. the moment that's okay let's take the moment just that jeffrey came in uh to welcome jeffrey uh we're yeah, getting started um i mean zachary i invite you to you know uh finish that your, was it point, that was man. that was pretty i mean i think the broad you know sweeps we kind of we kind of get uh just to say that i'm very interested in the kind of the jailbreaking of all of this mm-hmm. the jailbreaking okay um and uh so I, I I wasn't I was kind of going to give a little bit of a personal, just not my take exactly, but um, a grounding more in the personal, like for which I think that you were doing that, Zachary, already. So I was happy to you know, just let that let you do that, and then I was going to do that, and others can do you know can approach this however they wish. But for the first thing I wanted to point out is that we're all on a screen right now, <laughs> and so. Uh, you know, when I, when I saw the film with my daughters and my wife, we, this was like our Saturday night fun. Um, (laughs) and the first thing that my eight year old said was, you know, why are we watching this on the on the screen? Shouldn't we be reading about this? (laughs) So it 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 doesn't take, you know, I think that what's in front of our faces literally is the thing that we don't necessarily see and that's maybe one of the ideas of this film um and uh i wanted to note just you know as well that i think all of us here have come of age or come you know pass through some in it through some phase of our adulthood uh in this transition from a televisual age to an internet age and it's happened 
really just in the last 20 years, right? So it's been relatively fast within our lifetime. And so we're all in the midst of this experience. And something perhaps about the way that the film seems to go on is because it really seems to, I, to me, it, it's a mirror that is reflecting our, our, something about our state of being collectively at this time. And so, you know, as a person who is experiencing this right now, e even in this moment, looking at, you know, experiencing you all th through the screen and transmitting myself through it, uh, it's a deep concern to me because it's so deeply troubling. Uh, and of course, as a dad, I have, you know, that concern for my children and then by extension for, you know, all the children. And we're in this interesting moment, I think, in our cultural, you know, in our zeitgeist where people are now becoming aware. They're seeing what's in front of their faces. Uh, and there's a sort of general, you know, freak out occurring. Uh, and that's what we're living through historically right now, I think. Um, so this talk with Jor uh, comes concretely because I wrote a review of a film by a fellow named Adam Curtis uh, named Hypernormalization. Uh, and this was a documentary that uh, I found on a website called Thought Maybe, thoughtmaybe.com. And when I saw the documentary and, you know, was moved by it, I wrote this review, we posted it on Metapsychosis, and then I, I wrote to the folks that, you know, I submitted a, a, a contact to um, Thought Maybe, letting them know about the review and pointing to, to them to the website and just expressing my appreciation for what they were doing because this website features uh, free documentary films, uh, pretty much all of which take some kind of a critical perspective on, you know, socio or sociocultural reality. Uh, and there's hundreds of documentaries on there which are freely available. And Jor made his film available freely for education, for discourse, uh, and for, I think, exactly the kind of thing that we've been doing here in the Cosmos Cafe, which is, you know, exchanging our perspectives and trying to, you know, grow our awareness and deepen our, our understanding. So, uh, J Jor got in touch with me, um, referred by Thought Maybe, uh, who suggested that we maybe might be interested in his film, uh, since we had uh, reviewed hypernormalization and because of the other kinds of conversations we've been having and the contents on, on our site. And so sent me an email, I got back in touch with him and um, watched the film. Uh, and, you know, we could open up a conversation about, uh, I think about the content of the film. Uh, but I wanted to just highlight two sort of parts to this before we kind of go there. One is the critical perspective. And that's what comes through Adam Curtis. That's what comes through the film. Uh, the, the film has a, a kind of creepy, you know, vibe to it. And the, I think one of the artistic uh, achievements of the film, you know, is, is its aesthetic. It's its um, soundscape. So, Jor, I think, you know, that's really cool. Um, and it also ends on a pretty, I think, serious question. And I wanted to highlight this as well. It ends with Derek Jensen um, asking or responding to the, to the question, what is to be done? If this is the case, if, if we can put, connect the dots, see what's going on here at the level of power, at the level of psychology, the level of the brain, and at the level of money, and we see that, we have a kind of a whole picture, then what do we do? And Derek Jensen suggests that we're too addicted, and the only thing to do, it perhaps, is to destroy it. So I want to ask what we think about that, what we all think about that, and um, including Jor, because, you know, as the artist here, you're putting that perspective forth. You're not necessarily answering it. Uh, and, and the other side is, uh, what would be the alternatives to that? Or what, <laughs> if, that, if, that, if that is not the only thing to do? I don't know. Um, but to start off, I, I would invite George to uh, just you know, give a little more, more of an introduction to yourself and your, uh, your own work. And, uh, you know, why, why you, what motivated you? Why, why did you want to make this film? And then uh, I'd love to hear from, you know, the others to re reflect upon 
what you've done. Let's let everybody have a, you know, have a say. Uh, and then from there, let's pick up on what seems most interesting and like just put our minds together and see where we could go with it. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds yeah. great. Yeah. Well, yeah, my name is Jor. I'm from Australia. I've, I've been living in Melbourne for the past seven years. I've, uh, I've been a filmmaker for most of that time. I came to start making films through uh, doing music, musical tech, technical production and design. So I was a musician primarily first before I had a hand at filmmaking. And um, yeah, Stare Into the Lights, My Pretties is my, my first uh, feature length documentary. I'd done a bunch of shorts before that um, around topics of, I think one short that I did really well, that did really well in Europe uh, was called Forget Shorter Showers, which was uh, based on an essay by Derek Jensen that it was dealing with climate change and how personal consumer choices would not be sufficient to mitigate against climate change. Um, but that's, but that's how I got into filmmaking. I was, uh, music came first and then, and then the films came later. And I guess the reason that I, uh, I mean, a couple of things brought about trying to make this film stare into the last my pretties. One of them being, I guess the shortest way to say it was, um, back in 2009 when I had an idea to sort of at attempt to make a, f a film about technology, criticizing technology and a polemical film about um, the negative narratives of, of surrounding all the, the concerning aspects of, of digital technology was in 2009, there was, and I mean, I guess this is, this sort of has a bit of history in and of itself. It's a whole other conversation, but there was a bunch of sort of uh, narratives that had gained a lot of, um, I guess, traction in the tech community around the, the positive aspects of technology. You know, people, people were sort of talking a lot about um, the, what I would see and feel would be more myths around technology that, that, you know, say the internet is inherently democratizing and things like this. And I guess what we came to see was sort of the Arab Spring and, and, and um, being heralded as, as these um, amazing examples of the liberatory aspects of technology. So while, while all of that has a certain reality to it, I guess back in 2009, um, what I saw was, was Google at that time, uh, not only scanning a whole bunch of uh, out of print books and, and sort of just privatizing the world's information and, and making this large digital repository for themselves, for them to monetize to, to, for their advertising dollars, which is their whole business. But also the other side of that, being the surveillance culture that they'd pretty much normalized by that point with, you know, Street View being in its relatively early days, driving around these sort of creepy cars that in, around neighborhoods, photographing everyone's house without sort of, you know, and just putting that online. And and if and if you didn't like that, then that that's sort of tough luck, I guess, was their attitude. Um, so the idea of the film sort of stemmed from there. I wanted to, it was originally an idea to sort of make a case study to use Google to talk about what happens when one company not only privatizes the world's information, but becomes the central repository for the discovery of information and then goes on to be just shaping people's information experience in a really profound way. I'm not sure if that's, if we've ever had that historically, you know, this centralized repository of, of information that's sort of mediated by this intensely powerful corporate entity and of course things have got you know significantly worse since then we've seen other other companies uh controlling other aspect other aspects of, of of the digital experience but that's really where the film began so i went off to do a bunch of interviews and and um start sort of exploring the ideas of privacy and surveillance and um and, and themes of yeah social control and I guess addiction came later but one of the things that became a turning point for the film is in the interviews I realized that it wasn't just one company and it wasn't just one technology it was the techno culture itself and it was the way that it was the way that certain societies give rise to certain types of technologies and then how those technologies influence the society and it's the interplay between the two and it's this cycle that goes round and round. I think that's what I found more interesting and the film really sort of 
opened from there. So I guess that's why the first part of the film looks a lot of the looks a lot at the history of the, you know where did the computer come from it has our origins in the military and same with the internet and i guess i guess for me that really framed the 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 um for, it, it provided the basis of where the film was to come from i wanted to look at that interplay between technology and the impact on society and and people being part of that so what was the impact on people then on a larger social on, on, on a larger scale what's the impact on society and then on a larger scale than that what's the impact on the physical world the the, the physical environment so i guess that's yeah that's 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 how the film came to be um yeah i i, I guess we could well, no that's that's pl that's plenty i mean that sure, there's a lot great. to deal with there i mean great <laughs> So why I think John wants to uh, chime in. So why don't we go around and you know, let's let everyone have their say and then see where it goes. Great. Well, I, I love the film and I saw it twice um, and I took notes the second time. And I'm just so pleased that um, someone has articulated in a, in, a, in a very effective way some of my uh, own doubts and fears about the use of the technology. Great. Um, so I thought it was very articulate. And, um, and I liked your choice of uh, the people that you interviewed. And I liked the, the way that they were interviewed. I, mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, something that stuck out was um, um, how our current uh, addiction or attraction to um, the way the technology is set up, uh, it inhibits a metaphor and narrative. Yeah. And um, those sort of... Uh, those um, highly developed skills that we have to make sense is um, in, has been inhibited, and and I think some repair work needs to be done, and I think this is the case that you're making. And uh, I have a lot of questions, but one question I have you 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 just said that you the interplay of technology that was your focus of how the technology uh, affects uh, society, and I just have a I don't know if this is a useful question or not, but um, what do you know now that you didn't know before you made this film? Wow. <laughs> um, basically all of it. I mean, it was, it, was a, it was a journey of not only self-discovery, but I think, yeah, I mean, discovering the work of Susan Greenfield, the neuroscientist, where she is talking about, yeah, that we're losing practicing the the long form thinking and, and deep thinking and, and yeah, things like metaphor and abstract concepts and so on and so forth. I think that really blew me away. That was, that was an analysis that I hadn't, um, that I think really helped make sense of, of a lot of other uh, phenomena that we were seeing, I guess, in the digital world. It, it, it was sort of, it, it, it took the, the guesswork out of it, maybe. Um, that was definitely something that I didn't know before. Um, but I think the thing as a whole, I think it was, it was really a drawing together of all of these, of, of, of the great work of a lot of other people that had all of these really deep, profound analysis in their work. And um, I guess what I wanted to try and do is sort of mash it together. I wanted to sort of bring all of their voices together and try and link up the... I felt there was a cohesion to the to the narratives, not only just on the on the personal scale, but on the larger social scale as well. And so I think, yeah, it was definitely a journey of not only self discovery, but coming to know that through the process of making the work. So, um, yeah, it was a lot of time of self reflection, sort of thinking, you know, what sort of people is the screen creating, and then what sort of society would be uh, cultivated and perpetuated through through um these technologies and and yeah and it just sort of going on and on so i guess that was a question that sort of came up and then uh invited a whole other um set of in of inquiry so but yeah it was, it was definitely a very profound learning experience which is great to, to feel to hear and and to know that it's that's conveyed through the work and i hope that really opens opens the same things up for people because i think that's what it's all about it's it's not just questioning our use of technology but 
questioning the, the, the existence of the technoculture itself and really looking at not only how it works, but where it comes from and where potentially it's going if it's left unchecked. So, yeah. just, just one follow up, if you don't mind. Sure. That was sure. great. Um, mm -hmm. And Greenfield, was that her name? Susan no. Greenfield, yes. Yeah, she was wonderful. There was just one, mm. I, I think you, you, there was one um, inter, part of the interview where she was younger and then an older version of mm -hmm. her. That, I just thought that was fascinating. You saw a younger, a younger person and then the older person. And that is something mm -hmm. miraculous about our technology that we can do. So we can mm -hmm. sort of um, do a kind of comparison about how, how this person's argument or point of view may have, may have changed or evolved. Um, and I think that um, there was something else. Uh, oh, I think what I also liked about the film, uh, one, one contributor said that we need to ask better questions because the questions we tend to ask uh, invite an easy answer. Mm. So, um, sure, exactly. one of the, and one of the big uh, research questions I think you opened up for me was you presented the bind that we are all in. Uh, the last speaker said, turn off your computers, but it doesn't matter if you turn off your computers because it's not going to change anything. But at the same time, uh, because we're all addicted to this, we need to destroy it. Um, and previous speakers talked about resistance is powerful and we shouldn't mm -hmm. get into the myth that this technology is just going to take over. Um, so I thought that you didn't solve the problem, but that you asked very uh, complex questions and that you left it sort of like uh, in that kind of um, that double bind. Um, so I thought that was very successful. Oh, uh, thank you. Well, I think, you. Very, I think that maybe the, one of the reasons, just a quick comment on that, maybe one of the reasons I did that is because I think, well, there's two parts to this. The first one is that I didn't want to do the thing that many other docos do where they have like, a 90 10 thing where they spend 90 percent of the the film talking about the problem and then they give you this five simple steps to to fix everything one because that's impossible but two i feel like those sorts of questions are really personal and really uh, something that you can really only answer yourself um you know the the, the one of them is if you agree that what you've just seen for the last two hours about technoculture and its trajectory is problematic and concerning what and you want to do something about it then what is your calling to do i guess is is and that's something that only you can answer and that only the viewer can answer so really i think yeah, the function of the film is just, as you said, to really just open up the questions for people and then it's, 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 it's uh, the journey of discovery to come to answer those questions and hopefully to act on it as well. I mean, not just turn off the computers, but if there's a greater conviction to, to dismantle the, the techniques, um, then, then so be it. You know, that's, that's great. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thanks. Thank you. And one other thing too, on the on the with Susan Greenfield being the 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 younger self and the older version was that the there were clips that I pulled from television. Actually, it was a television interview that she did in probably the same year as the uh, maybe twenty ten or something like that. Um, and I guess that's where I I saw that on television. I was like, I have to look her up, and so I looked her up and read some of her books, and it, it, that's that really sort of spurred me on. It's like there's, there's someone out there that, um, that has a lot of experience sort of researching consciousness and is very interested in uh, how, you know, neuroplasticity and the, and the scientific functionality of how every sort of moment your, uh, the, the, the physical connections in the brain are shaped by your experience and, and that, mm -hmm. you know, in turn strengthens the connections and so on. So, again that was something i didn't know before and that was something uh not just in terms of screen culture but that's something that uh is really profound to come to know in your life that that every single experience you have shapes who you are and and um that has that can have profound consequences in, in and of itself but especially when you bring screen culture into the mix so yeah thank you, thank you for your comments yeah, and questions my pleasure thank you Thank you. Um, maybe it should, should, 
Sorry, Marco. Should um, I? Um, no, go ahead. <laughs> well, well. How about let's let Ed and TJ and Jeffrey. Uh, I, I wanted to pick up on uh, on on the Greenfield uh, personality here. Sure. Um, I was I was very appreciative that uh, that she showed up here because I I'm an American. I live in Germany, mm-hmm. and um, there's a German. Um, cognitive psychologist, neurologist by the name of Manfred Spitzer, who's done a lot of work on the uh, negative impact of uh, technology on our psyches, our consciousness, and our, our, our way of life, so to speak. And, and he's, he's very much maligned and very much um, um, uh, put down. And I've never been able, and, and since he's the only reference I have, he's in German, it's very hard to translate him into English for other people that I'm speaking to. So it was really nice to find another one, another psychologist, another psychiatrist of this type who is saying basically the same thing, that there's not just an upside to the technology, there's very much of a downside. And we underestimate that downside. We need to, we need to focus on that a lot more. And, and I, um, Spitzer wrote a couple of books. One of them is called uh, um, uh, Cyber Sick. If I literally translate it, the other one's called Digital Dementia. And they, they very much outline the negative effects, especially on young children, that um, digital technology can have. On the, even not just digital, analog technology as well. The, uh, mm, yes, the yes. end where the children are watching TV. Yeah. Well, I have a three-year-old here in the house that I look after a lot. Um, those were the most haunting. I can't get those out of my head now. Mm-hmm. Uh, really the most haunting scenes for me. So for me, that was a, a real advantage i wish i wish this film had been made 10 years ago when i was still working Mm. because the last job that i had in my career (laughs) do you want to call it that i was working on european projects that had to do with um vocational education but one of the since it was an there was an it focus to it the use of technology in education Mm. um and and i find that it is, it's, you know, it's so overrated and it's so overplayed and it's so hyped and there's really nothing to back it up. Um, I also um, I took a degree in educational technology from uh, an English university where I spent four years fighting with my uh, tutors and professors about, well, is it educational technology or is it educational technology? And it was always the technology that had the focus and never the education. So... And so I could I could have used that because I was always surrounded by people in the European projects that I did. They were all funded by the European Union, people who were just enamored with technology for technology's sake. Mm. But if part of my very diverse career that I have, I, I lived and worked in Silicon Valley from 1983 to 1997. Wow. And, and so I was there, so to speak, when this all took off. Mm-hmm. Um, one of, one of the anecdotes I like, I like to tell is that in 1994, uh, when we first set up a, um, a web server and, and actually had a, a browser installed on one communal computer in the office that I was where I was working for a, a medical technology company at the time, um, 90% of the people on the, on the web at that time lived within 10 miles of our business. Mm. So it was, it was very much a valley thing then. And it expanded rapidly and it got other places. But the people that drove it and the, what really carried it is what you had said earlier. And it's this, it's this, um, this belief that the technology in and of itself is inherently good, whereas the technology is just in and of itself technology. And it always takes a human being to do something with it. And what we're doing with it is what needs to be questioned. And that's the thing that I appreciated the most about your film is that it said, well, maybe we ought to just stop for a moment. Just think about it, you know, just just take a second and reflect once on what you just saw and why you thought that was good. And that is very often enough to get the ball rolling if you can keep people's attention long enough to do that. Because once they realize that they're probably advocating something they're really not all that excited about in the end, um, it does cause uh, profound disturbances, let's say, in, in the groups. Of, we had the projects that I had, when, when I started questioning too much, um, 
the technology itself or what it might be used for or how it might be coming across, um, then you notice the reactions go up. And most of those are very addictive reactions. You're trying to take, you're taking my candy away from me if yeah. I was in, if I'm talking to a child. And so I found that the, the film really helped to reinforce a lot of the points that, that I've been trying to make for a long time, but it says it in a much more coherent and cogent way than I have ever been able to do. So that was my, my, my reaction to that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one thing that, that comes to mind just out of that is, uh, uh, it, it reminds me, I mean, I, I personally myself wish this film came out 10 years ago. <laughs> Things have, 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 have gotten so much more complex, but I think that sort of the – we've sort of disappeared down the rabbit hole a lot further um, in that time um, since the germ of the, the, the film sort of came up. I think, you know, back then the technology that to, to make sort of um, simulated content wasn't, wasn't – as, as concerning as it, it is as it is now. I mean, like people talk a lot about fake news, and I saw I saw this article just before we began tonight. Actually, about I think it was um, some senators in the United States or something are starting to be concerned about uh, video, like digital video manipulation, in order to make mm -hmm. um, fake content. And there was a, there's something that I've posted on the on the stare into the lights my pretty's website in the resources section about this quite a while ago in that Adobe had was was looking at making software uh, to insert words that people had never said um, mm. out of a relatively small audio sample of their voice. So say for example, if if someone was recording our conversation, they could take the audio of my voice and and put it into this this computer and and you know type out a few sentences and the computer says what is written in the sound of my voice and there's this other sort of i can't remember the university perhaps it was university of pennsylvania i can't even remember now but there was another research team that had had taken like uh video like facial recognition tools and were using uh the the output of those tools to input into another set of tools that would manipulate faces in real time. And what I could see with the convergence of those technologies is if you've got like a, a someone's face and you can sort of make their mouth move and their facial, you can control their facial expressions through sort of some kind of um, automated process and then you put the sound design with it, you could essentially have some kind of public figurehead making statements that they'd never made in the real world but look convincingly real. This is This is... You know, and I imagine that it'd be something uh, that would become much more problematic over time, which is, I guess, is what this article that I saw this afternoon was about. Yes. The lawmakers are increasingly concerned about the rise of fake content that is very, um, that looks very legitimate and, and is almost indiscernible from, from real content. And so I guess that sort of plugs into this whole fake news thing. Um, I mean, there's much more to say about that, but... Um, the the other thing I wanted to mention from your comments too is it makes me think of and and other pe I feel other people have sort of talked about this much more coherently and and have a lot more depth than than what I offer in my work I feel like I just offer a glimpse into this mm -hmm. because I'm I'm still sort of coming to learn it myself but I mean Adam Curtis's hypernormalization was mentioned before I think that's a very good resource to sort of understanding how um, information manipulation is coming to sort of have a really profound and deep effect on the functionality of of, of the way society is, is organized and um, I guess public discourse and, and then decision making it has profound effects on democracy and, and so on. Um, but an, uh, what I was going to say is that uh, there's a book that by one of the, the, the snippet that by this person Jerry Mander that I used in the film he wrote he's, wrote, he's written a bunch of books um, one of them that I read not while, a, a fair while ago now that was written, I think, and maybe Marco can correct me if I'm wrong because I think he's read it too, um, called Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television. I think it was written in 1960. It was late, late 60s or early 70s. There he is. He's holding up now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and 
And that sort of goes into, uh, touches on this a little bit, even all the way back then. And another book of his that I think was written in 1995, which I'm still reading at the moment, called um, The Absence, or the, is it The Absence of the Sacred? I think it's called. Um, which, is, which, which really sort of plugs into the comments you were mentioning before about how the, what the profound effects of technology are on a really fundamental level. I mean, you mentioned analog technology and digital technology, but he's sort of talking about um, it's, it on, in a more fundamental way about technology itself and how, yeah, the impact on the personal and s social level. I think that's a really important book. I'd, I'd, I'd love to finish it, but I even recommend it like so far, even though I haven't finished it. But those two works are great. And a lot of other, um, if, if people want to dig further into this, I think a lot of the participants, in, a lot of the participants in the film themselves have their own really good work that sort of stands on its own, um, that can be extrapolated into a larger social scale uh, critique um, you know Sherry Turkle's Alone Together is, is a really um, pertinent book I feel especially as robotics and artificial intelligence becomes much more a part of the mainstream conversation now and sort of is, is a larger part of the public's awareness not just in technological circles but just you know as part of general public discourse and sort of the fascination with automation machines and how you know, we can just fix the social problems caused by technology with more technology. I think that's problematic. But that's a really good book, Alone Together by Shiro Turkle. And there's a bunch of others that I, I imagine we'll, we could probably tease out later on through the conversation, but they're just a few that come to mind through what you were just saying. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for saying all of that. If, if I might step in, uh, Marco, um, um, you mentioned uh, Jor, is it? Um, yeah. Hi. You, you mentioned um, um, Jerry, this book on four arguments against television, or I read that yeah. back in the. Oh, series. great! Nice. And one of the reasons why uh, Ed, when we talked about the perverse sides of the technology and the discussion on the forum, it was that book that always sits behind these discussions about technology mm. and its non-desired consequences um, because it was a very good argument that showed that television had these um, pernicious effects that weren't obvious at all from you know just watching it and uh, mm. the arguments were quite cleverly constructed and they've always mm. served me as a kind of a typical example of these these unintentional sides of the technology that are never clearly present in the technology and that we need to tease out when we mm. when we're working on them. um i uh also because the effects are baked into them is, is that the point you're trying yeah, to make like say for example with the television them. the reason that it's that it's so um i guess isolating is because it's a passive technology you're just sort of sitting there letting the images wash all over you and i guess the book is about this but well yeah, you know, but this idea that um so I, I put that into the remarks in the forum that um, mm -hmm. the first 30 minutes of watching television it's a stimulant but mm -hmm. after that it's a depressant so yeah um you know those are not obvious but you know the studies have eventually shown these kinds of things but i mean there's lots of other examples in television but uh, um and um um i also appreciated the film a great deal one of the reasons why i'm late today is because i just gave a two-hour seminar on the ethics and legal questions around augmented reality so augmented reality mm. is clearly addressed in the film and it's obviously a technology which is emerging right now dealing with screens but the screens have become in a sense transparent you're looking through them mm -hmm. rather than at them and so they've become these intermediate layers between what we're looking at the world and obviously this is a part of the culture of screens which is interesting and so the idea of so i'm a researcher and augmented reality is one of my areas of research and so um the the effort of partly motivated well not just i already had this before i saw your film but um, the film i certainly i i shared the film with the students in the class 
and um, we've had a number of discussions about it already. And um, so I actually think that understanding the ethics of these technologies is critical to developing them. So, for instance, mm. one of the things with augmented reality may have a lot of negative consequences, but yeah. if you're defining, designing the technology, you may be able to design versions of augmented reality that make people more aware of the ethical issues that are present in the use of technology. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the problem with the web and the internet is, you know, they're not good tools. There are not a lot of good tools that make you aware of your use or the, or the slot machine mentality in the, in the smartphones, yeah. uh, you know, and all the cognitive um, engagements that they perverse cognitive engagements sort of nothing that sort of there are a few apps that top stop you and say do you think about this but there aren't a lot there's no systematic way of doing that so mm -hmm. i do think there is a pro uh, uh, social a societal project that is and and in a way your film is a call for a societal project it's saying hey guys if we just let this go the way it's going to go we're in serious trouble so we need to look at this as a society, whether or not this is what we want to be doing. And it is a film, I think, that's 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 coming out at the right time because um, I've actually just in the last few days I've seen stuff on news feeds and general discussion, even in around uh, with through other people. Sometimes in circumstances that have nothing to do with the context here, where people are aware that there is an issue on this, uh, you know, that they're beginning to say, we need to do something about this. So I think there is a kind of a, I'm, I'm hopeful anyway, that there's a kind of a, a general uh, effect that we have to do something about this. And um, the, the people who were most, that I was most interested, I was interested in Greenfield, but she didn't, she probably, you know, because I work in this area of cognition, so she didn't actually say, much that I didn't already know, and so it didn't mm. sort of strike me so much. But mm. people like Roger Clark or Natalie Schoon uh, were the people, uh, you know, I, I wrote by hand what they said, because I thought, I kept, because <laughs> I thought it was so, you know, this whole argument about who has control of the technology, and, and uh, Roger Clark goes into this quite, quite extensively in his remarks about the the Jews and the, the, the in the Holocaust and and uh, mm -hmm. Rwanda and and the uh, and the genocide in Rwanda and the fact that whatever you have you do could get could come back on you in a in a nasty way. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that that was probably one of that's one of the sort of darkest points in the film that. Um, it's sort of looking back in history at what sort of uh, what sort of power information or, and and relatively simple information as as already. Um, I mean, yeah, the examples that you just mentioned. Roger Clark sort of talks about this. Uh, talks about how the dangers of of. of you know, as we see, that there's historical examples when informa relatively simple information about populations has been used um, for a horrible atrocities. And I sort of have this feeling that uh, with sort of we can see that fascism is coming back in a big way. I mean, I'm in Europe at the moment, I'm sort of touring the touring the film around. I've been in um, Berlin for like the last two months. I guess it's a it's a strange place to be because a place like Berlin has a lot of the, that history sort of baked into the city, and it's a sort of the very it's part of the very core fabric of the city. But um, even just being in, in in Europe and talking to other people, other activists here, and other filmmakers, and I met someone from Greece not long ago who is who is uh, uh, coming through the apartment that I'm staying in at the moment. We sort of had you know fleeting discussions about the the. Uh, when when the economies are collapsing over here, there's this sort of resurgent fascistic element coming back. And so one of the things that I think concerns me with the screen culture is this potential for us to go back to that historical place with, uh, you know, a fascist regime would come back and then all one would have to do 
would be to you know open up facebook and then and then round up everybody that that is undesirable on facebook as we saw i mentioned the arab spring i mean that's what happened in egypt uh, you know the the transformation and I, this is not something that i understand in a lot of depth but i think it's something i would definitely like to explore more is that um yeah that you know regime change was very interesting in that area of the world but one of the things that was uh very concerning was to see that you know, after the transformation that happened in Egypt, how the, I think it was the Muslim Brotherhood, I'm not sure, but the security services after the regime change in Egypt used Facebook to round up all of the people that, well, not all the people I shouldn't say, but um, just undesirables and people that were protesters and, and activists and, and, and used, the, used their information to find them and then torture them. So I think this, 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 potential for something really horrific and catastrophic to happen just on an information level is something we're already seeing potentially beginning to unfold. And I think looking back in history at those other concerning times should be the, the should shock us all into just how much we are giving our lives to the screen and who benefits from that. And as we see, it's these large corporate entities that often have very close relationships with the United States government. You know, Google has a very close relationship with the State Department and, and Facebook has its history with, you know, getting seed funding from Incuter, which is a uh, venture capitalist firm connected to the CIA. So, there, yeah, the, the, I think the potential for darkness is immense and it should shock us into this sort of... to. Yeah, not only ask the question of what is going on and what are we doing, but w if we think this is problematic, let's stop this. Let's do something. So it's a call to get us back to the real world and, and engage with the real world as things become increasingly chaotic, you know. So I, I would like to say in conclusion. Sorry, Jeffrey, the, do you mind if I just interrupt for a second and just say I'm going to shoot out, guys, but I really appreciate the conversation tj i'm sorry i couldn't hear anything from you i wanted i really was desperate to kind of call you in even without wanting to put you on the spot but i wanted to hear something from you too so um just big thank you to you guys um uh zero one great movie awesome thank really you. appreciate it <laughs> um, zero and, one. <laughs> and i will i will see you guys online okay take care okay. bye 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 Zach. So I was just finishing up to say that it was a two-hour film or slightly over two hours. Yeah, and two I was enthralled from start to finish, uh, which I didn't expect in a documentary. I usually sort of look around and <laughs> think about some things, but it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all do with the screen. It's a, that's like a very screen wave. I mean, I do the same thing myself. It's like It's all about skimming and it's all about sort of clicking around and you sort of jump from place to place place and just get little snippets of everything what's exciting but so it's very it's very uh it's very i guess it's a very what am, what's the word i'm searching for it's a very lovely thing to hear that someone actually sat i mean i know i don't know it's long i mean two hours is a long time for a film but to hear that someone sat through the whole thing that's that's great oh, i sat through the whole thing <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, twice. I also yeah, sat through the whole thing twice. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm a great. I think we're talking about this tension between depth and span. You know, we want to we want to get this a little bit of everything, a smorgasbord. That's great, but mm -hmm. we also have to zero in and yeah. really study something. Um, this this technology can be a wonderful tool for that. Yeah, um, but you have to have a an attention span to make use of it. <laughs> and yeah. that's, that's, I think the st big stressor in my own life is, um, you know, how do I filter, but not filter too much, you know? Mm -hmm. So. And that's one of the, th the, th again, with Susan Greenfield, what the, one of the great things she says in response to that too, is that you need a, you need a good teacher. You need sound thinking processes you need the foundation and framework of um critical thinking and critical analysis and comparing and contrasting information and you need to sort of have this educational depth to be able to survive the skimming through and actually learn and internalize that information to to come to form knowledge so yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, the screen can be a great tool, but as Eli Parissa says in the film also, it's like that's just not something that we see. You know, the internet offered this great 
promise to make us more informed, but we're not seeing that from the data. You know, what, what people are more interested in tuning out and, and looking at cat videos and playing computer games. It's just so and trolling that's, that's, <laughs> and trolling. Yeah. So that's, it's, it's incredibly sad for me, you know, that, yeah, I mean, I think this tool could be incredibly powerful f and, and it is for, for, um, cultivating knowledge and, and giving a depth to our awareness, but we're not seeing that on a larger social scale. And I guess that's one of the dilemmas of our time. I'll just add to the chorus of uh, praise for your film, Jor. I really did enjoy it. I also sat through it twice and it didn't feel like <laughs> two hours. Wow. This was very informative. Uh, my biggest takeaway, um, you had asked earlier about what, what are the kind of precedents for this kind of information collection um it's kind of an inside joke i'm the, I'm the history buff of the uh, <laughs> of the group here Great. but uh, we've seen we've seen this cultural technological interface change before we've seen oral tradition give way to writing and we've had mm -hmm. as late as plato john had mentioned in a discussion a little while back um plato having socrates complain well you know this outsourcing of memory is gonna kill culture and it didn't yeah. kill culture that time because there you know the scribes had power um, or access to those who had power. They were a, a smaller percentage of the population. There was an oral society still going on around them. So writing didn't kill culture. Writing shifted to printing. Printing mm -hmm. didn't eliminate correspondence going back and forth. Not everything went through publishing companies. Not everything ended up on a state ban, the index as the modern state was developing. Printing moving to electronic media, uh, uh, McLuhan um, was, was analyzing. But uh, my, I, was one of the uh, generation raised by people who remember r radio and television as kind of auxiliaries to life. You know, mm -hmm. after two hours of watching TV, no, go get outside, use your muscles, use your imagination, you know, <laughs> enough of this. And it didn't, um, television and, and radio and electronic media didn't kill book culture, which is what our education was based on, as you were just talking about, as a kind of you need that kind of depth, that kind of ability to analyze and, and deep think things, you know, before you can kind of put the screens to use. But this is, this is, this screen culture is now an encapsulation of, of kind of all of that. And that's what makes it unprecedented. We've never been, the quantity of information that can be collected, all that, you know, and then the, the use of the, the media, we've never seen that before. We've never seen something that really does threaten if we're not careful to kind of take over from all the rest, of the, the rest of the cultural media that's out there. And I think the film really brought that out well. I thought that was a good point. Mm -hmm. Also pervasive is I think the exact, the exact word to use about, about the whole media. And I'm just reminded I'm at my lunch table at work. It's so funny. We, uh, all the people who are raising children and they remember the last time their friends or relatives had come over and you have a, a group of kids sitting in the same living room and they're all, you know, <laughs> tapping away, playing games or anything. And, and to hear the parents at my lunch table, we're all complaining about that. And what are we doing? One's on mm. Candy Crush, one's <laughs> on Facebook. Mm. Um, listening to jazz concerts. Oh, I got to share this with my you know brother, the other aficionados. So it's kind of, it's not just children. It's, it's, it's everybody. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think that's one of the important things to realize is that we're all part of this too. I mean, I, I haven't I haven't had a mobile phone for maybe seven or eight years now. Um, it wasn't something that I did like sort of consciously. It was more just I, I went away once and it didn't do the roaming. And so I, I liked not having it with me when I was away and I sort of decided to just not use it when I got back to Australia. So, but I, I think it's, I think it's an important point to to recognise that it that it that it's that it is all of us and uh, and as Katina Michael, one of the participants participants in the film, talks about, is that mimicry sort of passing that on to, to the next generation? You know, so what are we doing where we're while we need that five minute break in our lives? You know, just just get a break from the kids. Where you know, just go and look at the TV for a little while longer. We're sort of passing that on, and and that's not our fault personally. You know, again, it's that's this is something on a cultural level that's um that can't be solved by personal consumer choices. You know, I, I can not have a phone and that doesn't, that doesn't change screen culture in hardly at all. You know, that's, that's not even a drop in the ocean. It's just someone that doesn't have a phone, you know? So I think that really begs the question of, of 
this isn't something that can be changed on a personal level. It, it needs to be addressed um, on the larger social scale. And I guess that to come back to the ending of the film, while is why that question is is so pertinent. I think um, is yeah. How how do we stop this? You know, I can turn my computer off, but it's it's not going to stop the destruction of of the world one little bit. You know. We actually have to dismantle this technology. And I think um, Marco, in the introductory m remarks, sort of posed that question. Maybe we could go around and, and I'd be very interested in, unless Marco wants to say something, I'm sorry. Well, um, I could pick up right there. Like if somewhere, someone today were to write a book called Four Arguments for the Elimination of the Internet, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's reasonable to assume that most people wouldn't take that seriously, right? They wouldn't take that, that they wouldn't see that as a serious argument, right? Uh, and if you were even to take it to the next level and say the elimination of technology, what would that really mean? Uh, like, does that translate to a political program? Does that translate to something that people can organize around? If it's not just a matter of personal like mindfulness around technology, and I, there is a movement around that, for a while, I was um, participating with a community um, called Buddhist Geeks, and uh, Vince Horn uh, and you know, the people around that were trying to bring mindfulness to uh, their use of, of technology. Uh, we would do meditations like online. Like, so I'd be really? sitting there in front of the screen, Vince would be meditating, other people would be meditating, like this, a conversation wow. meditating. Yeah, I'll be showing, I'll be showing. And... Um, and that, that, that movement of mindfulness has kind of seeped into Silicon Valley as well. So now you have more of a kind of awareness or, you know, within the cultures of the need for balance and the need for, um, you know, more healthy types of habits around, around technology. But it doesn't necessarily change the underlying business models, right, of, of, of the companies or of the way that technology has developed. So it really gets back to that that question i think at the which is left hanging at the end of the movie i mean it's left kind of just in in a indeterminacy and that's what is to be done uh you know certainly there's a lot of things we could do personally there's things we could do at the level of family my daughters watch a lot less they're on the screens a lot less than i am and my wife are uh, and a lot less than i was when i was a kid partly because i've gotten so um uh, sort of un, uh, sick of, in a certain way, sick of, uh, maybe sick, really, literally uh, sick uh, yeah. of, of the um, of the experience of always being connected. That I want to protect them from that. And mm -hmm. now they look at, you know, it's the kind of thing where it was fun. It's 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 pleasurable, but it's not necessarily fun. All the because you get that, ex there's a sort of exhaustion. Somebody brought up the book called The Burnout Culture, uh, which just from the title of it, I think, you know, there's a psychic kind of burnout effect that, that, that's happening. And then to, you know, to act from, from that is a difficult um, proposition, I think. So I don't have an answer. Uh, I think that that's a really profound question. I, I, also, th I also think that there are people who are making positive changes, and some of it has to do with, really the question of who owns the technology, who controls the technology. I think that's really a, mm. um, an underappreciated leverage point uh, because when you trace back to, you know, the technology is, is not magical outside of our own consciousness. And so the intentions that we bring to the technology as human beings, and this is something that we've talked about again and again, are important. And Mm -hmm. If we look at that level of the human intentions, then the technology always ends up serving somebody. Uh, and if it's serving you know, uh, groups of people who maybe are not as reflect, you know, maybe have nefarious purposes or just are ignorant uh, as to what their you know, real, you know, the, the effects of their actions are, um, it opens up some pathways because we can own technology too. You know, we can, we can reclaim technology. We can change how we use it. We, we may not be able to not to have it, but anyway, I mean, those are just some initial thoughts. Mm. And uh, I mean, one, one of the reasons I talk to these people <laughs> is because uh, they, 
help me think more deeply about matters that are of concern to me personally and to you know what I see as the world. I think that this is you know it's crucial for the world, for the worlds we live in, the world my my daughters are going to live in, that we get a handle on this because it is I think a, a crisis in the making. Definitely, I mean, I, what, maybe sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I didn't mean to. No, please go ahead. Um. Well, yeah, I, I would really like to hear what what other people think about this. I think because I think it's a really profound. Um, I mean, it's, it's such. A, there's a lot in there. There's so many questions in there. But one thing I will say is that I think it's it's all of that. I mean, I I really I totally agree with that. Um, we need to be doing all of that. We need to not only reduce our engagement, but change the sort of engagement that we're having with technology. We also need to look at and assist people that are creating different types of tools. Um, but I think underlying all of that, which is one reason why I'm really, uh, why I left Jensen's question hanging at the end is that I think I, I think I agree with him in that not only is our addiction so deeply seated with this technology that we won't give it up and that that's why it needs to be destroyed is that it can't be reformed because I mean, Lewis Mumford wrote, wrote a really great essay about this um, called Democratic and Authoritarian Technics. It's hard to really condense down because it's already itself a really dense work. Um, it's again on the Stare into the Lats My Pretty's website if you look at the resources and click on essays. But I guess one of the things he's talking about there um, and I guess it's something that I didn't really get to explore in a lot of depth in the film because I think it's probably a film in and of itself. It just has so much depth to it. Is that these tools, because they come, they have a, an, an, an origin in, in the ABC power blocks. They, they originate from the armed forces or the bureaucracy or the corporate power. Is that it's hard to reform the tools. It's like, how can you make your own computer? How can you make a computer by yourself? You can't. You're always beholden to those corporate forces. Even if you were to, a, you know, and I have a lot of respect for the open source software movement and the open source hardware movement, but at, at the level down of the supply chain, you've still got to get the, you know, the silicon chips made somewhere. And then behind the silicon chips, you've still got to do the rare earth minerals mining in order to manufacture the, the, the silicon chips. So we're talking about industrial processes that enshrine corporate power. And we really, it's going to be a hard thing to separate reforming <laughs> technoculture if technoculture is driven by those those three power blocks by the the ABC power blocks. So I think we can tinker with and it's important work to tinker with our usage, but it's one of the reasons why I think that that question about disassembling the whole thing is really important because I think the only way to really profoundly stop this is to stop those three power blocks from driving the technology. So yeah. Well, and, and 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 that's why I'm interested to open it up. Like, but how how do other people feel about that question? Is it, is it, do we feel like it, it's something that you know, if we if we just change our usage, we can change, or you know, do, do people think that it, that it all needs to be destroyed? And you know, what? I think I, we. Oh, go ahead, John. No, no, go ahead. I'll, I'll after you. I'm, no, I was just gonna. <laughs> okay. No, I, I think it's the level of the we that matters then, because if you mm -hmm. have a kind of mass withdrawal, not even, well, yeah, withdrawal is a good word, right, for addiction, but I think it, it, it depends on how many people we can get the message across that, hey, you know what, you you bought the device, you bought the data, but everything else you click or everything else, you, you don't have to buy that. You don't have to click as much. You don't have to spend as much. Time. And I think it's a kind of, it's got to be a, it's got to have a, um, a, a mass. It, it, like you said, it can't just be like one or two people shutting off their phones, but yeah. if you can get, yeah. if you can get a whole layer of society to, to start with, at least that pushback is going to register to the data collectors and mm -hmm. then it might have to change, you know, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'd like to respond to both of what you were saying was very useful. Um, 
for me to organize my own thoughts around this. It's a very big question. Um, mm. Addictions, yeah. if you really uh, analyze the structure of an addiction, there's almost always a, a positive intention behind the addiction. Mm. And usually they're very deeply spiritual. Um, um, so smoking, um, heroin, alcoholism, shopping, there's usually something behind these uh, behaviors, which are dysfunctional, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. driving the behavior. And if you want to change an addiction, you have to replace it with something as intense mm -hmm. as, that, as that addiction. I had, um, and then you'll reach a threshold. And we've all had this experience. We've had a terrible relationship or an awful job or something dysfunctional was happening. And we put up with it over and over and over again, or we forgive the, the person or, or the situation. But something happens and we snap. We reach a threshold. And then we look back and we say, I can never go back to that again. And I'm a different person. And it's kind of scary. But, you know, it's better now in this unknown. And it's more intense, and more fulfilling potentially than what I just got out of. And uh, just as a personal experience, um, when I was very young, I was a heavy smoker. I started when I was like a teenager, peer pressure, you know, and I wanted to be hip and cool with the group. But when my early 20s, I was uh, performing and I was doing a lot of Shakespeare and I already had a wheeze. You know, when you're doing Shakespeare, you need a lot of breath. And I was going, <gasps> and I thought, man, I'm too young to be wheezing. So I, I made a vow. I'm vowing on my love for Shakespeare that I will give up cigarettes. And I announced it to everybody. So I made a really big deal out of it. And a week later, I was smoking again. And I was so disgusted that even with that vow, I had, I had, I had broken the vow. That, that was what created that threshold experience. I said, fuck it. <laughs> Put it down. I've never smoked again. And the person that I was when I smoked, I feel, who was that person? I have no idea. So mm -hmm. I'm just saying that as I, and I want to give my um, thanks to Marco because he was my mentor here um, because he got off of Facebook. And I said, damn, if he can get off Facebook, so can I. <laughs> Great. <That's laughs> and amazing. I did. Great. I haven't posted, well, I posted just a little bit of things. Um, I went from one minute, maybe a drink uh, here, a drink there, maybe five, maybe five. <laughs> I've, gone, I've gone. Well, actually, that's important because when right. you get off, yeah. the, when, you, when you break the roller yeah. that you made for yourself, you need to acknowledge it. Okay, I did. I, mm -hmm. I did. I failed, but that doesn't mean I'm going to stop. And mm -hmm. um, I've I've dipped into it a few times, but I've gone from five minutes. I, I guess maybe five five hours a week to five minutes a week. And I'm using my energy here on, on Cosmos and on the the psychosis the metapsychosis journal and uh, creating a, a community uh, in atmosphere that uh, fulfills those spiritual needs for community and interaction and discourse that's uh, civilized and um, asking difficult questions, um, which you won't get on Facebook. So I'm just saying, can we use the technology? Yes, let's do uh, resist uh, those who, the dark forces that are manipulating this technology. But can we do that in a way that we're not making war on those individuals who are lonely and have no place to go, who want to make a transition into something more, um, beneficial for themselves and for others. Uh, and I think that's where we need to, rather than have a, another war on drugs, a war on poverty, a war on cancer, we've had that war metaphor, I think has lost its usefulness. We need to find other ways. Um, that doesn't mean we should stop, we should give up resistance to those we should be resisting. But I'm wanting to create a forum like this and this could be, you know, um, we may be doing like little baby steps here, but if we can cultivate our collective intelligence here, um, I believe this would be a way of using the technology in a different way than, um, and maybe some of the initial promise and euphoria that many of us felt um, could start to return and 
having had the experiences that we've had, we could turn this disaster into something that we can something that we can relearn. And as many of your contributors made the point, our brains are extremely plastic. And uh, the environments we in, we are in shape them, our, our nervous system. So um, we, we may have fucked them up, but we can also, we have enormous powers for rehabilitation and repair. So I believe we can use metaphors, we can use narrative, we can, you know, explore in depth a certain uh, questions that we hold. Looking at your film, for instance, Jordan, um, bringing us together and contemplating what's next. Um, I think these are all, you know, um, opportunities for us to find an alternative and create intensity and momentum. That's a, a different kind of intensity than a thumbs up or a thumbs down. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you, John. I, I'd have some things to say. Um, um, about this question and also maybe in linked with Johnny's points. Um, so a smartphone to some extent is, um, I mean, I think part of the argument is the smartphone is a device which uh, creates a certain kind of relationship with the person and the relationship tends to be packaged into small pieces, right? So it breaks up experience into small packages, which is the argument that maybe we need to dismantle this technology because it does this perverse thing, right? I mean, we all think the communication aspects are great, but the fact that it breaks up our experience in these very small pieces is what is really deleterious about the technology. So, but, but I come back to this idea of techniques that you were talking about, Joe or related to Mumford's work, but also Johnny's argument about narrative. So um, I think that the problem with, with not just smartphones, but the entire technique around phones is that we've abandoned the narrative approach and we've favored this, these non-narrative approach, which break up experience into these small things. So it's not just abandoning the phone won't do it. If we don't abandon that technique, we won't get anywhere with abandoning the phones. So it's more complicated than just the technology. It's the way the technology structures our experience, which is, which is the problem. And if we don't address and reorganize the way we allow our experience to be restructured through these different technologies, then we're not going to get any further just by dismantling the technology. So I think it's I think it's still arguing in with Thor rather than against, but I, I just think it's a nuance on the, on I the argument. I totally agree with that. That's 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 amazing. And thank you for saying that. That's great. I would totally agree with that. If I can uh, pick up on that. Um what I keep hearing everyone saying, and I, and I think it's absolutely true, we have, what, what we need to affect is a change in the way we think about what we do. We need to have a change of mind. We, and, and it's actually a metanoiety. We really have to, like in the New Testament, it says, turn around. You, you, have, to, you have to start thinking differently. And what we what we tend, and I think that um, Marco's children are a good a good example of this. They they aren't as much involved with the technology, or or they might have a bit more distance because they're being in, taught or encultured to think about what it is that they're doing, and this the self reflection upon what it is that we do and why we do it is absolutely necessary. And if you don't take that step. You don't ever stop smoking and you don't ever stop addiction. You don't ever stop doing anything. You have to change your mind. That's, that's absolutely priority number one. We have to get people thinking more critically about not what they're doing so much, but critically thinking about what they do. Mm. That, that is step number one. So, and, and that's, that's the harder one of the two things to do because the other thing that I, I suggest is feed the beast. I don't think we should dismantle it. I think you have to flood it. You have to be so into it, but you have to be in it in an aware way. 
you have to feed the beast so that it collapses, it implodes. If I can go back to something that George said a, long, uh, a while back, Congress is worried that fake news can be generated because you can do all kinds of technical things to make things appear other than they are. And that's absolutely true. There are precedences in American courts where video and photo evidence is not admissible because it is too easily manipulated. It doesn't prove anything anymore. So later on down the road, when, quote unquote, the government comes and makes a case against me, well, they're not making a case at all because it can all be manipulated. And if everyone is aware that can be manipulated, if everyone is aware that this can be constructed in ways that we perhaps can't even imagine right now, what value does it actually have for enforcing whatever point it is that I'm trying to make? That goes away. And that only happens if you feed it. When I was in the intelligence community a long, long time ago as part of my very checkered, potted career that I've had, the thing that you could do to bring down any intelligence agency was simply provide it with information. You couldn't handle it after a while. We've got to the point now we can't handle the information that we have. So give it more. Why stop now? I don't have to put down my phone. I can just put more into it. I don't have to sit here and consciously do that day in and day out. I wouldn't suggest that at all. But there's nothing to stop us from feeding the beast, and the beast will devour itself. And that's, that is, and I think that I'm born out here with all the mythology of history, evil cannot sustain itself. It always implodes in the end. And so we have to be aware of that. But if we're not, and now I'm back to point number one, if we're not aware of that going in, we will implode with it. That's where we have to make the difference as far as I'm concerned. That's all I had to say. That's a pretty radical uh, statement. <laughs> and, well, for a curmudgeon, it's probably <laughs> uber radical, but nevertheless. nevertheless. <laughs> well, I mean, you're, you're describing essentially um, Vladimir Putin's uh, geopolitical strategy. I, I don't know if we are, because I think that's so overrated that I can't even <laughs> begin to describe it. Well, no, I'm Weird. serious, though. I mean, this is uh, essentially what this is what has changed in the last 10 years is that it's yeah. become political. Uh, it's no, no longer a matter of personal addictions and our kids. Now it's a matter of real, you know, power politics uh, at a global level. And I mean, you know, part what happened in the, in the last I mean, what Obama you know, did for the first time in 2008, Trump turned around with Cambridge Analytica and tried to, you know, to, to kind of repeat for his own purposes at the same time, Putin was involved, you know, apparently. Uh, and, you know, his the strategy is just, it's not to try to make somebody believe one thing or the other. It's to cr create epistemological chaos so that mm -hmm. nobody knows what to believe. And in that yes. confusion, that state of confusion, then you can exercise power. And it's the same so that, story. I mean, that's, that's a, I kind of agree with you. And I think it's, it sounds fun. Uh, on a certain level, but on another level, yeah. you know, it's it's really like the recipe for like world war, and which is why I tried to hook the two together for precisely that. I agree with you 100. percent If you're not aware going in, you have chaos coming out. I agree. It's something and that's the thing because you know we were manipulated, quote unquote, by the Russians by bots. You know, to put that in Putin's shoes is a real shortcut to, okay, he happens to be Russian too. It's something that has no, a lot it's of the top, It was organized from the top down. I mean, they, they have... You, they you have, know that? No, no, I'm sorry. I mean, really. Well, not, that, not, the not, journal, that, if, I, if I can believe the journalism, uh, if there you, are... Well, well I can't, but... In, in St. Petersburg <laughs> that are dedicated to... That have people go to work, essentially, like industrial uh, level... Uh, you know, psyops. They can yeah. write the bots. They pose as you know as real yes. people in discussion forums and on Twitter and etc. But this is a you know an organized operation is what I'm yes. is what I'm saying. It's not just people. And and, and the other side of that I coin, hackers. But the other side of that coin was Arab Spring that was very much funded and initiated by the CIA as well. We're, we're doing the same thing. 
Well, so, you know, know they're doing it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they're doing it. We can piss off when they do it. Okay. I don't think we aren't doing it. The, our governments are doing it. Well, yeah. I'm saying we is. Yeah, yeah I have to have a blue passport, unfortunately. But, no. but I believe we should put everything out on the table, and we can yeah. we can put on our critics' hat. But I think we should put it all out there, and I think that's interesting what you were just saying. And maybe we should do more of it and do it better. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the I think it was Bashkar who said that the masters rely upon the creativity of the slaves. Mm -hmm. So I'm very. Um, and this may be outrageous what I'm about to say, but um, but I know this group is sort of put up with. <laughs> but, uh, one of your one of, Jordan, one of your um, your speakers, she talked about the screen. Uh, it it moves us from three D to a two D. Mm -hmm. So there's some of our senses, like the kinesthetic sense, the sense of touch, proprioception, which is left out, mm -hmm. and that that can become extreme. You know, that's bad for people. <clears throat> um, but I was also curious about moving from 3D to 2D creates distortions in our uh, capacity to make sense. But also, what happens to 4D and 5D? You know, these are, um, we're talking about like an integral age might emerge if there are enough people who could move from uh, 3D to 4D. That would be a subjective sense of time that is not uh, hooked into a clock. Um, this would be the subject and object could blend in ways that are difficult in 3D. Um, so I believe that if there are enough of us who can um, harness this kind of energy that comes from a fourth D, 4D perspective, um, that we would have the depth that is required to tip the system into something that's more meaningful for all of us. I'm not saying that everybody has to get it, but enough of us have to get it to, mass, to create a threshold um, and also to give an alt uh, a possibility of alternate ways of knowing and of making sense than what is given to us by uh, the, the screen. So we can use this for our own purposes rather than be used by it for some nefarious actor's purpose. Um, so this is, I think, something that I, I believe is a, a useful direction uh, for some of us, not for all of us. And many of us are coming from different, you know, different backgrounds and different levels. And um, I think the younger you are, the harder it's going to be. Um, but maybe there will be enough young people who will say, I don't want to be like my parents <laughs> who were lost in, um, in this technology. Maybe I'll do something different. So, and I'm meeting young people who are extremely smart um, and who are very savvy and very aware of this. And, um, you know, and who like, who like to read books. So I'm not, so I think there's um, hope, um, considerable mm -hmm. amount of hope because, you know, we, you know, our evolution has been based on face-to-face -face communication um, and being in real time for how many centuries, thousands and thousands of centuries. And uh, it, I just can't believe that in 10 years of using the internet, that that's all been wiped out. You know, I think we can um, recognize the danger as this film has pointed out to us and we can start to reorganize our behaviors and, and more creative and useful useful in more ecological ways. I'm, or I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe that. Yeah. Right now we've sustained a two hour conversation. We've used our attention spans considerably. And perhaps even because we've listened to each other in a careful way, we've been able to take uh, different positions than the ones we started with. I think these are, are, are signs that we have the skills that we need um, and we can um, get even more skillful. Yeah. John's making my case for changing your mind. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, we can do both. We change. Yeah, I, I, I mind, agree. My mind, who's mind? I agree. Yes. You know? But we have to change our mind. Like we have to change the way we think about it. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. And move out of this flat land that we're yeah. stuck in. Well said, John. Well said. 
I still think you have to feed the beast. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? What does that yeah, mean? I was going to ask that. I was going <laughs> to. this a... I, one thing I would binge on infinite conversations so, yeah, yeah 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 depends what you're reading um but one thing right. i wanted to say when we were sort of we started to talk over each other a little is that uh and marco i think you were trying to get there but didn't actually get the chance to get there is that uh this sort of information manipulation, like the technique you were talking about where you just overload your population with a tsunami of information so they the the position to be discerned can't even be found anymore has a really sort of sorted history i think this as a propaganda technique through the use of the screen has become really well oiled now because the, they're able to do this in a way that with a with a scientific pre precision that's never been before possible and this goes back to the early days of the you know smoking companies um using junk science to sort of skew the public debate about whether smoking gave you cancer and was problematic and then this we saw the same thing a couple of decades later being used in the debates about climate change uh you you know see big oil and all of these corporate interests banding together to just confuse the public that's the goal you just wash the public with all of these contrasting views and and just bowl them over with information so no one is even really able to find themselves anymore you're just basking in this big information tsunami and i think that's really what the screen does really cleverly and one thing i'd be concerned about uh i, I mean yeah hyper normalization is a, is a good sort of venture into this world how we've sort of moved into this postmodern political discourse world where a lot of things aren't real and the real is how do you discern the real and so on and so forth but i think one of the things that's problematic about feeding the beast is that yeah we're not in charge of the beast even if we try if, even if we're going out to try and confuse the beast by feeding it information and i've heard people talk about this with trying to trick the facebook algorithm for example mm -hmm. you know people getting creeped out by getting really targeted ads through facebook so they're like well i'll just talk about you know wanting to buy cat food or something and not having a cat just so i can skew facebook's demographic <laughs> profile of you know to try and confuse them but i think that's a zero sum game because you you're still beholden to the Facebook machine. You're still beholden to. It's a game that you that I don't think you can win. So I I think I'd be very. I think I'd be reserved about you know even trying to be to be aware doing that and coming to that with an intention of being aware. I think that I'd still be very concerned about that being effective perhaps. Well, I have this persona here, mindful AI, just kind of meant to be a funny, uh, you know, pseudo bot. Mm -hmm. And when I <laughs> Facebook, I, I, I actually, I created a fake persona because I needed to keep access to some accounts like page accounts for some a couple clients and for even the metapsychosis Facebook page. So I called it fake AI. And then I realized, well, that would, I started imagining how fun it would be to pretend to be fake AI and essentially flood Facebook with bad information or, you know, but, but really it was stupid because uh, I would be that whole time, all the, the creativity that I would be putting into that mm. would be only further perpetuating my use of Facebook. Let alone, I mean, Facebook couldn't care less. I mean, they'd probably figure it out eventually and ban me or whatever. But really, that's my life energy going into this game that I'm playing on the Facebook platform in order to, uh, you know, confuse it or, or, or what have you, or just confuse my, my friends or my so-called friends. Uh, but I'm still on the platform. So nothing has fund actually changed materially in terms of where my time, energy, and attention are going. So what I would hear in Ed's phrase, change your mind, is where is your time, energy, and attention really going? What's it really doing? And if you could connect those dots and you could see what you're feeding, then not 100% at all. Because, you know, we, 
we're, we're living on the grid, we're part of a society, but we could begin to move it towards other initiatives. We could find cracks. We could find the other people, the other en- in organizations, the other movements or what have you that are trying to do something differently and have some integrity. Uh, and I, I believe that there are many people who are trying and who do have integrity and need help and support. And I totally mm-hmm. agree with that part of it. Like I, I agree with that, Ed, that, one way I would put it is is coming to understand what is happening in the black box, like what is happening behind the curtain, you know, who's pulling the strings. I think that is very important for people, to, for all of us to understand, you know, what happens when I click this button, What ha- what's happening behind the screen. And I think something that's concerning with young people is that um, – and maybe this, maybe this can be solved with education. You know, you just need to teach young people about the mechanics of computers. This is how you program a computer. This is how it programs you. And having that awareness, I think, is, is, is much more important into what you bring to the tool rather than what the tool does to you without that awareness. Um, if you understand what the black, what, how the black box, black box works, black box works, then... Um, I think you're able to interact with it in a way that is more perhaps meaningful and you're less, um, yeah, you're, I guess you're less susceptible to, 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 the, to the problematic forms of manipulation that the film goes through. So, or even just understanding what a platform is for. I mean, Douglas Rushkoff talks a lot about in the film that, you know, Facebook has this sort of myth that it's there to help you be connected to your friends and help, you know, to be this social tool, but... And I mean, that's an ancillary effect of Facebook, but its primary purpose is to get you to disclose and then to use that very rich data stream to monetize your relationships and to sell you targeted advertising. And one other part of this too is that another thing that you couldn't fake, even not just with Facebook, but I think Facebook is a particularly interesting example, is that you know, yeah, you can still tell the Facebook algorithm certain things, but the way that it that it comes to mind this data, you're still in physical space. You're still, you know, you can't really lie easily about your location. If, if, you know, the tools in your phone, the, the facility in your phone runs on GPS, you know, (laughs) yeah, yeah. You need to forge a whole bunch of stuff in order to really start fooling this grand machine. So I think there's a, there's a very, there's a depth of understanding that would be required in order to try and fool the machine. But then there's also all this other technical work you would need to do in, to in, order, in order to mitigate the negative effects. And as Marco was really um, saying something there about how you're giving away your life force, I think that's the critical point. I think what would be more valuable would be to ask the question of like, yeah, what am I doing with my time? And, and what, what am I giving my life force to? I think... That's 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 a that was great. Thanks for saying that. So I'm going to say one of my crazy things. Um, so um, here's an idea. Um, maybe we're in the process of witnessing the end of capitalism. Mm-hmm. Um, let me explain myself. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> in a time when we are all questioning what capital is and its omnipresence and all of these counter movements you could argue that that's precisely the time when the sort of monopoly think of capitalism is breaking down and that we are in a period where we are questioning capitalism now whether that means it's actually disappearing is an, is another question But I do think there is an argument, and this comes back to what Marco was saying about alternative movements and the whole effort on that we're doing through the site, Internet Conversations, is an attempt to create alternative ways to do things. And it might seem like a Don Quixote against the giants and the windmills of the ABC world, but I think that the hope is, anyway, that that it may be powerful in the way Don Quixote was powerful, right? Don Quixote, who was a crazy guy attacking the world that couldn't be attacked because it was so big and so 
present that you couldn't attack it. And yet Don Quixote, his spirit still lives today. And so there's a sense where, anyway, you know, maybe it, it, it's an argument and, and I'm willing to be shut down on it. But, uh, no, I think I agree. That's no, it's great, a, Jeffrey. That's great. Yeah. No, I'm with you, John. Jeffrey. The I'm alternative was we all get targeted because we're on this uh, video feed talking about the end of capitalism. But uh, <laughs> exactly. what you're talking about is what you're talking about is narrative collapse, and this might be a, a transition period where that's happening, yeah. and that's that it in is itself narrative. is significant. And perhaps it might be the case. I mean, I've, I've uh, again, there's there's a lot of other people that have done really good work on this. Um, there was a documentary series I remember seeing called, uh, it was either The Ascent of Money or Addicted to Money or something like that, mm -hmm. talking about how if you see in the collapse of previous civilizations, there's, there's always this pinnacle moment before collapse happens where uh, the populations are at the height of creative output and creative expression and the culture is really booming and, you know, intellectually, it, it, things are just going along smashing along greatly and then there's this there's this collapse i think you know i mean i'm not i'm not an expert in this area but one of the things that i found interesting is to see that phenomenon sort of repeating in history if you look back for it um especially specifically to do with money but to br to bring it to the technological argument and what you've just said about the collapse of capitalism perhaps that's yeah, perhaps that's something that we're seeing. I think it gets more sort of complicated when we bring in sort of postmodern philosophy and how postmodernism has really had a uh, profound influence on these, how these types of discussions are perhaps not so grounded in, 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 well, I'd want to say physical reality, but again, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, it maybe, maybe I'm, I'm in agreement with what Jeffrey was just saying that, you know, it, as we see capitalism collapse, um, things get increasingly chaotic. But I guess that's the 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 grand window to envisage alternative ways of of being and and alternative alternative ways of of existing and and coming to know. And you know, we've said the word epistemology a bunch of times. I think that you know that, that window it in collapse is not only really important, but I think um, can be prized open a little bit more, I guess, as, yeah. as it becomes part of people's reality more viscerally. Can I, can I, yeah. can I, can I respond? Um, just to sort of reconnect uh, something I mentioned earlier about that, that 4D, the fourth dimension, mm -hmm. and what in the hell that could possibly be. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about some of um, one of your contributors Maybe it was, uh, I can't remember her name, but she said uh, they did studies on people who are playing the piano. And there were some who uh, practiced, and then there's some who didn't practice, and then there's some who just imagined practicing. Mm -hmm. And those who imagined practicing did just as well as those who practiced. Those who didn't practice didn't make any progress. <laughs> so that's a way of using the imagination in a very creative way. And we can use our imaginations in extremely destructive ways. <clears throat> so, uh, but I think that's a way of us to connect to um, metaphor and seeing one thing in, term, in, in terms of another, um, being able to use narrative in, uh, in really compelling ways. So rather than fall into utopia or dystopia, um, I'm, a com I'm a concrete utopian. You know, I'm not into this banal optimism. I think that's bullshit. Um, let's recognize the problem as we are, and we're bringing our intelligence to the problem. And But I don't think we should just search for solutions that um, I think we need to get to a higher level. Um, so we're not trying to solve the problem at the level of the problem. And I think that's very wise that your film did not end with uh, some proposed solutions. I think that would just be a waste of time. Totally. Um, well, and that's why I say I, I think we need it generating all. something else. We may not yeah. know what that is, but we have yeah. to use our imaginations and our God-given gift for metaphor and tell mm -hmm. different stories. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah, I think it's really important. And, and again, I, I, it's 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 
why why I decided to sort of leave it open to that really personal level because I think we all have different skills and we all have different talents and different abilities it's something that I can't prescribe an answer for everyone you know and I think we need it all we need people working on new t different types of ways of telling stories and and communicating and we need to I think I'm in broad support of, of all different, of a multitude of responses to this problem, not just sort of trying to attack it on this grand scale. I mean, the personal level is important too. The social level is, is just as important. But um, I think we need it all. We need, we need everything and anything. Um, but, but you're also pointing to the ecological level as something that maybe doesn't get resolved necessarily if you change your mind or if mm. you have... Well, I that's mean, that's. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I mean, you know, to the the fourth. Well, maybe to tie a couple things together. Um, mm. Capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. The end of capitalism. If this if this, if this is what it's, is happening, I, I think one of the arguments about about how that is the case is is not because capitalism has failed, but because it's succeeded, because it creates uh, through automation, through you know all of the. Um, you know, the, the kind of the intensified powers of production. Yeah. You get to the point where you can create, you can produce what you need for, mm -hmm. for a society, but without, but you don't, you, you don't, you don't need all the people <laughs> to, to, to yeah. produce it. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah. so what do you do with all those people? Uh, right. If there aren't jobs. Where's the success? Well, I mean, the idea is, and what you start are hearing now from people in Silicon Valley is you need to give them some kind of basic income. You need to provide some minimal standard of living because otherwise they're going to go nuts and they're going to threaten the world for us. You know, we like having, you know, our, our wealth and so forth. Um, so if, it's, if, cap, if capitalism ends and you have this kind of state of, sustenance of a large population through a universal base, basic income, then you need all the technology to keep just to, to give people to something to do, something to pay, you know, something to be involved in that you need to have entertainments, you need to have distractions, you need to have diversions. But the black box, what's behind the scenes is still a system of ownership, where, you know, which is concentrated in re very, very few people relative to the whole population, who actually do control the, the, the technology, the AI, the, the governments, etc. And what if it ends up that way? And is that so bad necessarily? I mean, that is not. A, I don't like. I don't like that idea because it violates a sense of autonomy or it violates a sense of dignity that, that I have. But you know, I, I guess part. I mean, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I've kind of cut you off too. To get back to what you were saying, I think. Let me name a couple of levels. I mean, one, you still have the ecological reality that people you may just be distracted from. Two, um, you, uh, uh, you, you may have also, and like, I'm, I'm just going to go a little bit further, a crazy thought. You may just have a divergence of different realities. And if you get to this level of simulacrum and AI and you know, pe people being able to choose their own reality more and more realistically, then, you know, this sense that we're all living in the same world, the sense that we're, you know, part of the same planet, etc. And you have folks like Elon Musk planning to establish colonies on Mars and, you know, the, the, the ideas coming from transhumanism that that really could just extend, you know, from planet to planet. Uh, I mean, if just to zoom out to the sort of, you know, big pic big picture in terms of human evolution and what's happening on a planetary scale, uh, we it could really just be a divergence of realities rather than reconciling into some kind of better world. Uh, it may be that some people have a better world and other people live in hell uh, yeah. or live in yeah. some kind of, you know, matrix-like simulation. Um, yeah. because they're, they're hooked up and they're kept alive for, you know, their, their consumption power, but that's it. Well, that's one Sounds thing that's like foam. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, that's one thing that's really important. I mean, there's a lot to say there. One, I think how I would ground that is that 
I see the collapse of capitalism coming about because it's hitting physical limits. If we're talking about the environment, that means the the economy is hitting the physical limits of the the physical world. The so you know we're depleting the resources. The the there's you know, I think it's 250 species are going extinct every single day. So if just on a physical level, the reason collapse is coming about is because we're hitting the hard limits of, of of the planet so to sort of bring to scale this up to what you were just saying about yeah the the this uh um d- the grand divide that may come about but and i'm interested in sort of uh the myths espoused by transhumanists and i think you know people sort of have the, elon musk is a good example because i think that's totally delusional to think that we can sustain this uh techno culture indefinitely i think there's hard limits to the techno culture even if we do nothing um and there's there's a book about this that i could recommend by um let me see if i can remember his name uh john michael greer i think called the ecotechnic future and i think something that comes out of that is um no no this is this is a better way to say it I, in research for the film i i was looking at uh, what are the ecological impacts of screen culture? Not just in terms of electronic waste, like what happens when you throw away your mobile phone and there's a terrible atro- atrocities that ha- are happening right now and still continue to happen in places like Ghana and China where all the e-waste gets shipped off and toxifies the landscape. So there's people living in, in the real world on the extreme end of, of um, the toxic effects of screen culture. But... One of the things I came across, came across in research, and, and this has also been covered extensively elsewhere, and I mean something that I read a long while ago about how the energy that goes into a Google search is the same amount, or used to be back then, it's probably more now, but I'm not sure, uh, used to be the same amount of energy as boiling the kettle. So every time you did a search on Google, you were using the equivalent amount of energy as, as, as boiling, boiling the kettle, which is quite a lot of energy. And when you think about the billions of searches that people do every day, that's a lot of energy. So no wonder you see all of these major Silicon Valley companies looking at ways to, you know, they build their data centers in in parts of the United States and the rest of the world that have really stable access to power and and um, and you know, there's a lot of electricity that is required to make the internet happen. And one of, what I was going to say is one of the stats that really hit me about the scale of this is that at current rates of consumption, this is excluding growth, at current rates of consumption, the total worldwide output of pollution that contributes to climate change that is caused, the, the output, the energy output pollution of the in, running the internet will surpass the pollution caused by the global airline industry by I think it's 2040 or 2050 at current rates of consumption. That is, so that ignores growth. So I reckon it will happen before then just because of the explosive explosiveness of digital technologies. And, you know, Facebook, I saw the other day as, as building a whole bunch of new data centers, I think two or three of them may even just be in Europe alone. I'm not sure, but so even if we're just looking at the energy that's required to make the internet exist, let alone all of these virtual worlds that come out of these computer technologies, it's not something that is going to be sustainable indefinitely. It's not going to exist in perpetuity. I think there's a hard limit to the technoculture. And the question is, what's left of the real world when we get there? So sure, maybe these millionaires like Elon Musk, and I think I've heard you know, other people talk about this, how, uh, say the, the, one of the head engineers at Google, what's his name, Ray Kurzweil, he wants to upload his mind to a computer and go off and be in a computer land in Google, which to me sounds like my own personal version of hell. But so I think these people are fundamentally delusional. They're not, they're not living in, in physical space that the, the, the technology and their, their world view has become completely separated from physical reality. There are hard limits to this technological trajectory, whether we like it or not. So sure, maybe a select few of rich billionaires will be able to upload their minds to the computer or get some kind of simulated, you know, consciousness and what they argue is the next step in, in human, human evolution and so on, they may have that while the rest of us are sort of stuck with this black mirror sort of style scenario where we're on the 
pedal bikes powering their machines. You know, we, we spend our, it's we're the new slave sort of things. Or we're, we're, we're the equivalent slaves of what we are now. We just stay addicted to Facebook and they mine our data and that's how they drive their machines. I don't know how it's come, going to come about, but I see that as a possibility, especially as, as, the, as the ecology of the physical world collapses too, you know. There's only so much um, fossil fuels left that can power, that can provide the stable energy that's required for all the data centers to, to continue to exist. I've heard people make arguments of like, well, that's why mesh networking would be something to look at as the internet collapses, perhaps at some point, you know, you still need to communicate. Maybe that's something to look at. But I think the important thing is, and, and is to, to, to ground this all back in physical reality, we can get very easily lost in these technological narratives of how we can live in these alternative worlds and how how the screen can be so alluring. But at the end of the day, we're just sitting in front of some plastic alone. We're all out here. We're, even all of us, we're just, you know, and this is what Sherry Turkle says in her book, you know, we're all just sitting out there on the internet alone. So if we ground that in physical reality, that's the end point of all of this. So I think it's really important in terms of um, framing any analysis from that from that standpoint. Well, helpful for me anyway to 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 frame any analysis from the standpoint of like, okay, we're in physical space. That's the grounding of of everything. That's the the, the fundamental core of our existence. Because without a without a real world, there is no social system. There is no economy. There is no technology. Without a real world, there's nothing. So. Well, I, that was great. I'm, I'm just wondering about when they are delusional, mm -hmm. what do we want to have happen? Um, we need to use our imaginations mm -hmm. and, I, and we need to articulate and put that into words as best we can. Maybe draw pictures and maybe dance around the room a little bit. We need to embody that. Mm -hmm. And then we need to ask ourselves, um, well, what needs to happen to make that happen? Can that happen? What's the yeah. first step? Make that first honest step towards that so that we can ground it, as you say, in, the, in something that's real. Mm -hmm. But we need to use the wish, the magic as if, and we need mm -hmm. to use the real, the reality, the implementation, the, you know, what, how do I balance this? How do I put this in a, in a time frame that works? Who are my allies? And um, then we can be critical, you know, and we can say, what's missing here? Um, but I think we need, and we've been working very hard on this forum here to like, our, um, to um, differentiate the critic, the visionary, the dreamer, and the realist. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that they don't bump into each other a lot. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have a whole lot of faith in these delusional people somehow waking up and realizing how delusional they are. <laughs> but, because they're not, they're unreachable. That's, that, that's, that's the yeah, problem. Yeah, but what, what, how do I want to pay attention? What am mm -hmm. I going to pay attention to? That, I believe, is within my control. Yeah. And I can just, you know, I can be critical of their, what I consider their delusion. And I can redirect my attention to what I want to have happen, and I can make that as clear to as many people as I believe that I can make allies and friends who can move in a direction, uh, borrowing from them, you know, their perspectives. So mm -hmm. um, we don't get into this pity pot mentality. And mm -hmm. as one of your speakers said, it's so easy to think that there's nothing we can do. That's part mm -hmm. of the myth of these technocrats yeah. who yeah. hypnotize so many people into thinking it doesn't matter what you do. We're the masters, <laughs> mm. you're the worms. And I'm just saying, this is, you know, if you just look at history, this is such a, a deep meta pattern, but mm. uh, they depend on our creativity. They need our attention. And when we mm. stop paying attention to them, that I think is when you're going to see what, what, the Wizard of Oz, remember she pours the water on the Wicked Witch and she's I'm melting all my mm. beautiful evil. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, funny it, mention, uh, it's funny you mentioned it's funny you mentioned the wizard simple, of oz you know? 
<laughs> well, it's funny you mentioned yeah. the Wizard of Oz because I was talking to someone the other day. They were asking me where the title came from, uh, came from, and it was actually a friend of mine who who I did a short film for called Feel of Poppies. She wrote a book about addiction, and one of the last lines of her essay is she was talking about how you're enthralled to the screens, and she said, "Stare into the lights, my pretties," and I, I'm fairly sure she's harkering to that to one of the scenes in the Wizard of Oz where. Hi. You know, poppies will make them sleepy, you know. So sort of make, there's that sort of analogy there or the metaphor there of, of, of you know, the opiate of the masses and, and bringing in their attention and subsuming them into the machine. So I think that's that's one of the origins of the title. And, it also, and I also liked it because it sounded a little bit creepy. So, yeah, yeah it's I, I, funny I, you mentioned that. It? It's funny you answered the question that I meant to ask at the beginning, which is why you chose this title. So you gave right. me... Without me having to ask, that's great. Great, but I think, no, thank John, you for saying that. Too. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, was, I no, just want to say that was great, John. Yeah, it's bringing up the point of of the little things that need to be done. It, it's yeah. city governors saying, "Okay, Trump administration, you don't believe in climate change, you're not going to do anything, but we will. We're going to put these oh. policies in place in in a municipal and a local mm -hmm. level." So sometimes it's a matter of just waking every as many people from the uh what, what plato the allegory of the cave just <laughs> unlocking as many chains as you can and turning as many heads as you can as painful as it is when you start mm -hmm. but you know no that's great well that's yeah, great, good, good point i mean you know, the, with net neutrality for example this you know in the united states the idea that uh telecom companies could prior, prioritize certain kinds of traffic uh compared to others but you have some uh, states and some municipalities that are uh, contravening that, that, you know, um, that they're saying that in, in this state, and I think New York is doing this, uh, we're going to institute net, net neutrality, but that's because people are clamoring for it. Uh, right, so right. Here in our city, we have, um, our city owns the, uh, the, you know, our internet connection. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, you know, obviously they still connect to the global network and that's connected to global capitalism, et cetera. But within within Longmont, Colorado, we have net neutrality, but that's because we locally want it. Uh, right. And I think that that's part of what we're also saying is that like what we, you could accomplish in small ways, it, ha it has to add up. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the only thing you could really hope for. I mean, are we going to have a global revolution now that's led by the, you know, the, the avant-garde uh, intellectuals? Eh. No. Um, so. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> yeah, I hope not as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, I mean, I, I, not to say that I'm not hoping for revolution, but yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I wouldn't like to see it play out that way. No. <laughs> sorry. Well, you, well, you, well, that's okay. Uh, TJ, sorry, you you were. Uh, oh, so sorry. No. <laughs> um. Well, it's been a couple hours, uh, and does that feel like a good place to? I mean, do we feel like that that point has been made well? I mean, the, what have we learned from this talk here that we didn't know before? That's a good question. Um, I feel. I like might step in. I actually think Please. that we've deepened our understanding of the issues. So what we had on the forum discussion and some of the discussions we already had, we had bits of the picture, but I think we have a, a broader understanding. I certainly do uh, of mm -hmm. the different ways that the issues feed into the larger picture. Um, I always feel, I always come away from these discussions feeling enormously enriched. And I, I think today is no exception. Yes, and I, I, what I learned is there's something that happens um, about our forum here and about the Cosmos Cafe that is accumulative. I mean, we've had a history now, six months we've been meeting every Tuesday. I've been there for almost all of them. Uh, and I believe that something, it's not so much what happens in the cafe, but it's what happens between cafe, uh, cafe gatherings. Um, and like you said, Jeffrey, I think there's a, a something that if you if you resonate with another person's interior or one um, on these calls, there's something like that inner that inner group 
that starts to to kick in because we're basically we're we're modelers and we're mo- we model one another consciously and unconsciously and I think that's a very real gift that humans have that uh, if they see someone who's performing well we say hey I w- I want some of that so um, and that I think creates that resonance and I think we can build consciously upon that and that was the great question what did we learn today and so i i feel like i'm more, more confident that we're in a, a moving in a, a healthy direction mm. so thanks very much yeah, thank, thank you john that was that was great yeah i feel like um i feel like even i have i've, I've it's, it's it's helped me come to understand different perspectives and and it's always great to hear feedback about just how different people see different things and 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 respond to things differently that's also really important and it's i am very thankful to have had this discussion with you all and 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 thank you for your questions and thank you for your very prescient insights and it's it's yeah it's been very helpful for me as well so yeah thank you keep up the good work jordan i hope another film is coming up Yes. Well, I feel a bit exhausted, but I, I definitely <laughs> think there'll be another. There's another film in me yet, at we least. We want more. <laughs> sure. Though, though, you can count on it. Good. And thank you for all the great work you're doing. You know, thank you, uh, Marco, for setting this up, and and all of you for coming, and and uh, yeah, and and the work you're doing in your own lives, and thank you. Thanks for everything you're doing, and keep it up as well. Keep up the good work. Thank you. All right. Yes. Ed, TJ, any, any final words? Um, I, I think it's just if I can just throw this in here. We have to change our minds, and I think we're working very hard, you know, our little groups in doing that. Uh, this is, you know, where I have to reinforce what John was saying. But we also have to think about the fact that what we're doing here, since it is on the Internet, since it's, it's all accessible, it will be accessed even the – um, you know, Salt Lake City will will have transcripts and will analyze and go through this. So we have, yes, we we have. Yeah. As I, as, and this is the point I was actually trying to make. We have spent very good quality time feeding the beast. Mm-hmm. We should continue to do that. Okay. I think you're the beast, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> And you sound well fed. (laughs) I do feel well fed. (laughs) The beast or beating the feast. (laughs) There's a haiku in there somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I'll go with that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yay. Yeah. Last call. Good. I'm good. Okay. We're good. Cool. Yeah. I'm full. Uh, yeah, I'll make sure you get a copy of this too, Jar, so you could do whatever you want with it. Uh, maybe we'll be in your next movie. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> blood, blood. Thank you, Jar, for an excellent film. Enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. I did yeah, enjoy it. Thank you for yeah. watching. Thank you. And a good discussion. Great. Yeah. 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 Cheers. Yeah. Thank. Thanks to everyone for a great discussion. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. A lot of fun as always. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Bye.